I stepped into his chest like it was a super massive black hole, which it wasn't. A black hole, that is. Pretty super massive though. If there's one thing we can count on in all of Allie Hazelwood's books, it's the fact that the main guy must be a hulking man. I know what other big black hole she can get into. to another reading vlog. The month that you're gonna see in this video is gonna be quite some time ago because you'll see my old haircut. You'll also see that I am in a different location. So during this specific month, I was subleasing a friend's apartment in New York. This was me transitioning to making the move to New York, as you can see that I have finally made, but I have yet to unpack the boxes in the background still. But during this specific month when I was acclimating myself to the city, I had a really good reading month. There were a lot of bangers, specifically cozy fantasies. So in this vlog, you will see many four-star reads and a five-star read. And this book that I rated five stars to this day is probably going to be the top book that I've read throughout the year of 2023. So I'll go ahead and show you what I was up to that month. But before we get into it, a message from today's sponsor. Today's video has been sponsored by Book of the Month. Their mission is to help readers discover new books to love and promote the works of emerging authors. So every month they go through hundreds of book titles and curate five to seven of the best books for you to choose to be delivered straight to your door. So for the month of November, I've chosen two books I'm very excited to check out. The first one is Check It Made by Allie Hazelwood because you know I have been eating up all of her romance books. This is her young adult debut, so I'm curious to see how she's gonna tackle that demographic. And then the other book that I chose is What the River Knows, which is a fantasy historical book. Honestly, I was just compelled by the book cover alone because it is so pretty. So we have two very different vibes going on, but if you're interested in checking out the other books that they've selected for the month, they are running a special deal for Cyber Monday. Basically, if you join and use the code for you, you can get your first book for only $5. Plus you can skip any month, anytime, and you will not be charged. Once again, $5 to get your first box. You're not gonna find a better deal anywhere else. And now let's go ahead and dive into the rest of the video. Hello, update. I have finished reading Love the Irregly by Ellie Hazelwood. I buddy read this with Victoria. We both think that her books improve with each subsequent book. They are very similar to each other, but I think she does like slight improvements where she knows what tropes work and then what to take out. Because the first book, my main issue with it was that it had so many forced PDA scenes and I hated that shit. Then in book two, she left that behind. And from then on, she kept on concentrating on our favorite tropes, which is a big hulking protective man simping over the main character who has done absolutely nothing to deserve such love and care, but that's the kind of escapism that we're looking for. So the main character in this one is an adjunct professor who is getting paid scraps. She also offers her services as a fake girlfriend because one of her friends developed an app that sets people up with fake partners, whether that's to like trick their families or they need a wedding day or whatever. And that also really taps into her people pleasing skills because she's really good at gauging what the other person wants in a partner and emulating that in order to to please them. She's always been used to putting other people's needs before her own while also making it seem like their needs are also what she needs as well. So Girlie's having like an identity crisis over here, but she doesn't even realize it. That's okay. Get your bag. So her favorite client is this guy who hired her to be his girlfriend because for certain reasons that you find out later, he is not able to have one and he doesn't want to disappoint his parents about that because they have a lot of high hopes for them. They're like rich people. I mean, if you have the kind of disposable income where you can hire like a fake escort to do that kind of shit, you are definitely rolling with money. But what she finds out is that he has an older brother who is another physicist like she is, but he kind of got into a scandal before. Several years ago, he had published this paper. It was so bad that it created a stigma for other theorists in her field, as well as ruined her mentor's career because her mentor was the same person that was his mentor at the time. And of course, in typical Allie Hazelwood fashion, the main girl also doesn't like the guy because he is broody and standoffish, which we all know the only reason why he is behaving that way is because he is secretly pining for the main girl the entire time. Except the juicy part is that he thinks that she's the girlfriend of his brother. So of course he's not going to do anything. And of course he's going to be more standoffish about it. I definitely feel like the author is upping the ante when it comes to the most ridiculous lines that I feel like she must be putting in there as like a joke at some point. There's a part 
part where the main character bumps into the love interest and it says, I stepped into his chest like it was a super massive black hole, which it wasn't. A black hole, that is. Pretty super massive though. If there's one thing we can count on in all of Ali Hazelwood's books, it's the fact that the main guy must be a hulking man. I know what other big black hole she can get into. At one point, the book literally compares him to being a fridge. And if you're invested enough, you too will want to be the fruits that get stuffed inside his fridge. He's a giant mountain of muscle. His bicep is an oak tree. His hands are stupidly large, but graceful. You could basically make a bingo card out of all these classic lines here. Like anytime the dude is mentioned to be huge or he has a big hands or he gets compared to like a fridge or a mountain. One of my favorite lines is when it says, he takes a step closer to the board, towering over me like a towering tower. Allie, let's be for real here. You're just yanking my chain at this point, huh? He stares like he's about to de-seed me like a pomegranate. What does this mean? Like he wants to scoop out your insights and eat them? Cause that's a new kind of kink that I'm not ready to uncover yet. There's a part where she wakes up to basically them having to share the same bed and she realizes that she feels something and it says, there's something very hot, very hard, very, very, very big pressing against my ass. Jack probably needs a pee. Don't men get hard in the mornings when they need to go to the bathroom? It's a pee erection, a pee erection. Yep. Not only is the main girl a steminist, a physicist, a theorist, but she's a linguist as well because she's already making up words on her own. During the sex scenes, he's described as playing with my nipple like it's an instrument. He's licking me inside of my breast like they're luscious sweet fruits. That's probably where the pomegranate metaphor came in. Of course, during sex, the main girl tells him, you have really big hands. And then at some point, the sex is so good that it's being described as like Sarah J Mass kind of universe explosion level. Somewhere in the universe, antimatter is being produced and it's all because of this, because of us. The main guy even says, no one has felt like this in all of history. There's some narration that says, I focus on my own body, the way that is stretched. I feel Jack in the bones of my skull, in the tips of my toes and everywhere in between. I'm like, girl, his dick is so big. It went up to your skull. Like does she need to see a doctor or something? The thing about these books is that you get exactly what you came here for. I'm kind of sad that there's not gonna be more within this Steminist universe where it takes place in a university or the characters being the science field. However, I am excited for her book coming out next year, which is going to be focused on vampires and werewolves. And you know what? I had a feeling that Allie Hazelwood was into the Omegaverse or werewolves because she was just describing dudes to be so big so often that I was starting to see some overlap. Plus in the epilogue of this particular book, it's a mention in passing, like just as one line that the main character was making her love interest read Omegaverse fan fiction. That line definitely came out of somewhere. So we're already getting this in her contemporary books. I can't wait to see what unhinged shit we're gonna deal with for a paranormal more romance next year. with three books this time and they were all bangers. This is turning out to be a really good reading month for me. I feel like that now I'm getting used to transitioning my daily life around New York and commuting every day. I have just been reading so voraciously because I love reading on the subway or when I'm commuting. It just helps me be so engrossed in the stories I'm reading. And in this particular case, I have uncovered that I am super into cozy fantasy books. I find them so easy to read and so fun because I think I prefer fantasies that aren't too dense and they're more of like a backdrop with a bigger focus on characters and the relationships. So I read three cozy fantasies. Two of them were four stars and the last one was a five star book for me. So the first one that I read is Half a Soul. This one was marketed as Howl's Moving Castle meets Pride and Prejudice. I don't think it was really like Howl's Moving Castle. It was much more like Pride and Prejudice because it takes place in the Regency era. The only magical part is 
the fact that a long time ago when the main character was a little girl, she was cursed by a fairy. That fairy took half of her soul. So because of that, she is kind of considered weird by other people. Like she's not caught up in grand gestures or emotions, which I guess is something that is more intrinsically human. She also doesn't really experience like fear or embarrassment. And so that kind of puts her in awkward situations or accidental scandals because back in the Regency era, a woman could like show an ankle and everyone would be clutching their pearls. But the main guy that she meets is a lord who finds out about her particular situation. And the way that they start off, she already didn't like him because he was very rude to everybody. He's basically like the least liked man in all of high society. He hates going to the parties and social gatherings. He acts kind of like a dick to other people. I really liked how their relationship starts to build off from there and how you get to know more about the main guy because his distaste for the rest of high society is rooted in a lot of the charity work that he does. He's helping these sick children and is a witness to all of these systemic issues that are going on and that makes him even more furious at high society who are wasting their time doing trivial bullshit. And when the main girl finds out about that, she starts to feel more passionate about these causes and starts to accompany him to help him out with a lot of the work that he's doing. So I love that they kind of become like this power couple and philanthropists that try to help out the underprivileged, even though everyone else in high society is like, what are you weirdos doing? Charity, never heard of her. But I really liked how the main girl was very straightforward and no nonsense and that matched really well with the main guy. And I like that she's appreciated for who she is and that she's still seen as complete and still a full person. So because I liked this so much, I picked up the next book by the same author called 10,000 Stitches. This one is like a Cinderella retelling because the main girl is a housemaid. Her dilemma is that she fell in love with this man of higher social status, but because she's a housemaid, there's no way that like a gentleman would ever marry her or even pay attention to her. So she stumbles into this fairy realm where she meets the main guy and he's really eager to help her out because he wants to learn more about English society. The only condition is that he wants her to sew 10,000 stitches onto his favorite jacket because something that she does is so whenever she gets really pissed off about something, which is often because when you're a housemaid and you're dealing with a shitty master and all of these spoiled rich people, there's a lot to be angry about. So she's just been stitching instead of bitching. So the stakes are that she has 100 days and 10,000 stitches to complete on the jacket. And during that time frame, she has to make the gentleman fall in love with her. I would say I enjoyed half a soul better than 10,000 stitches just because I like the couple from the first book better. I think they had more chemistry and banter. Whereas the fairy guy, I think he's too much of like a nice guy. Maybe I just wanted more edge to him. His whole deal is that he wants to be a more virtuous person, which is why he offers to help her out in the first place. But I think maybe it would have been more engaging if we found out why he wants to be virtuous so badly, especially if maybe something tragic had happened in his past or something like that, that would give a stronger motivation or add some layers to him or maybe qualities that he has that would challenge his goal for being more virtuous. But I kind of felt like his character was more one note in the sense that he was really just there to help her and that's it. Class consciousness is definitely a bigger theme in this book though, because as a housemaid, she is so angry about the disparity that she and her other colleagues are feeling. And I like that her anger gets emphasized in the book and it's a pretty big theme throughout. There's a line where she says, I know that I am no one because no matter what Miss Buckley or Lady Culver do to me and no matter what they take from me, they will never face any consequences for it. I wish that I did not have this anger. I wish that I was wallpaper. I would be less miserable if I didn't have to understand how unfair this all is. I am powerless and this anger is good for nearly as little as I am. You also start to see how her anger can affect certain things that happen in the story and she beats herself up over it. And I like that the main guy, despite him being more vanilla and a goody two shoes, still validates the way that she feels and tells her your anger is not ugly. And basically the lesson throughout the book is that anger is a good thing and it can be used as a weapon to like empower you to stand up for what's right. If anything, this anger is very justified. The point of this book really is to just eat the rich. And then the final book for my cozy fantasy era is the book that I'm gonna rate five stars, which is Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. This was a book chosen for one of the book clubs that I'm in with friends that I had traveled with in Thailand. One of them started the book before me and she messaged the group chat saying that she felt like reading this book was like going through a vocabulary lesson. That was what made me have trepidations because as a dumb bitch, I fear dense books like that. But fortunately, despite my limited brain cells, I was still 
still able to digest this book. The whole format of it is basically this scholarly paper that the main character is writing. So there are footnotes that expand more about certain topics that she's discussing. All those footnotes went way over my head, but it's okay because I could still follow along the story. So the main girl is a professor who goes on a trip to the far north so that she can study fairy folklore. She's doing this research because she is trying to write the world's first fairy encyclopedia. This is pretty much uncharted territory, but she is so smart and meticulous when it comes to research. The only thing she's not great at is dealing with people. And the thing about doing research in a small town is that you have to talk to other people. You have to get along with them. You have to get them on your side so that you can get important information. But she's not good at all that small talk or being around other people's company. She is literally just interested in her studies and her dog, like no other humans at all. And this is like a village in the far north. So she's also struggling to like try to get a fire started, trying to survive out in the boonies. What made me even more invested in this book was when the main guy gets introduced. He just barges in on this trip that she's on and decides to join her on her research. Just like how the sun is also barging in through the window right now. So I will tilt the camera. So this guy is a pain in the ass to her because one, she never even invited him. Two, he is considered to be her academic rival because he studies similar things to her about fairies, but she doesn't even consider his research to be accurate. And she's pretty sure that the research he's been doing for fairies has been fabricated and inaccurate. But the reason why she hasn't tried to call him out or get him kicked out of the university is because she's pretty sure that the reason why he is making up these false papers and studies is because he's actually a fairy and he's trying to throw people off their tracks. So that's the juicy shit right there. So when he joins her on this research, she's willing to let it slide because her motivation above all else is scholarly research for fairies. And if she can get closer to this fairy right here, all the better, even if he is annoying as hell to her, especially since he's the one who's able to charm the townspeople when she couldn't. And he keeps on getting in the middle of her research. It's very frustrating for her, but it's very amusing for me. I love the dynamic between the main girl being very no nonsense and kind of curmudgeonly. Like she's basically like a bitter old lady who just wants to be left alone and wants to nerd out with her studies and research. Meanwhile, he's a very outgoing, flippant kind of person. It's just fun to see their dynamic and how the main guy clearly admires the main girl and is into her, but he's so dry about it. Like he will straight up compliment her, but is so wrapped up in this dry sense of humor that he has. I also really like the main girl and how useful she proved to be in all of the action scenes. Cause obviously when you're dealing with fairies, there's gonna be magic and mayhem afoot. And since the main girl is like a regular human, she doesn't really have the physical prowess or the magical abilities to fend for herself, but she's able to do so because she knows so much about fairies that she's able to think her way out of problems without having to rely on magic or physical strength, which I think is really nice to see. It's cool how her love for research has proven to be so useful in these action scenes when she's trying to get out of a bad situation because she knows that like mixing things together or bartering the fairies with a certain item will help her get out of it. So we love a girl who can use her brain cells. By the way, I love how he is so casually violent, which is slaying random fairies or people when he's trying to like rescue someone or try to finish a mission. It just adds to how flippant he is about everything. So I'll read out loud some of the lines that I highlighted. For context, all of the book is written from her point of view because she's writing this paper. But at some point when she's like out of the picture for plot reasons, he takes over her journal. And so we get a little bit of his narration from his perspective. And so he was talking about this battle scene that happened where he's fighting another creature. He's using his magical abilities, which include being able to warp time a little bit or go backwards a few seconds. And he says, anyway, eventually I grew bored of the whole thing and knocked the sword out of his hand. Then I knocked his head off with one well-aimed stroke, nice and clean and hugely satisfying. In fact, I liked it so much that I wound back time and did it again, just to hear the lovely thunk of his head hitting the snow. I had just decided to have a third go at it, for we folk like things that come in threes, you know, when you roared at me to stop. Oh yeah, so he wrote his entry in first person, but he also addresses her as in like, I did this because you did that. It's nice because then you get to see the dry way that he speaks to her in journal entry format. So at one point after their exhausting adventure, she falls asleep on his shoulder and he says, I suppose this is as good a place as any to leave things as I see that you are stirring. I hope you don't mind that I didn't dislodge you when you slumped against me in sleep, your head coming to rest on my shoulder. No, silly me, of course you'll mind, but perhaps I don't care. I just love that it's so obvious he's into her, but he's so low key about it at the same time. I found out that this is not a 
standalone book. Apparently there's going to be a trilogy. I could read multiple books with their adventures. So I'm excited to see what's in store, but this is definitely my favorite fiction book of the year so far. It's almost the end of the month now. So I will see you next time for my final book. I said I would update later and then I never did. Fortunately, I do remember the last book that I read that month and I even took screenshots of a couple of excerpts too because I did like this book. It was called Word Slut. This is a nonfiction book written by an author who has studied linguistics. It is a book that deconstructs the language that we use and how historically and even present day now, it, it reinforces sexist ideas about women or masculinity. This is something that I think most liberal people know already. So I would see it more as like an introductory kind of book for people who maybe are not as familiar with these concepts, but there were still things that the author pointed out that I did find relevant to my previous experiences working in a predominantly male workplace. So some of the screenshots that I took include this excerpt that says, women's conversations have a distinctive turn-taking structure, a style of talk that Coates likens to a musical jam session. The defining characteristic of a jam session is that the conversational floor is potentially open to all participants simultaneously. In such conversations, you might hear overlapping talk, speakers repeating one another or rephrasing each other's words. Everyone is working together to construct meaning and thus the one speaker at a time rule does not apply. Simultaneous speech does not threaten comprehension, but on the contrary, permits a more multi-layered development of topics. This jam session structure is something you rarely find in exchanges among men. In fact, Coates has found that one of the most defining characteristics of men's conversations, one that helps maintain its hierarchical structure, is that they tend to happen in alternating monologues or stretches of talk where one speaker holds the floor for a lengthy period of time without any interruptions, not even in the form of minimal responses. This is a way for a speaker to play the expert or display their individual knowledge of a subject. This part just reminded me so much of when I used to work at an agency in Virginia where some of the managers were very much a brown noser, if you know what I mean? Like they were constantly trying to impress their own bosses and as a result, we would have to suffer through them talking for a very lengthy amount of time. And I distinctly remember making a presentation to the team on a topic that I chose. The topic was about graphic design in North Korean culture because I was reading a book about it and I thought it was really interesting to share for this show and tell thing that the creative team did at my agency. This is something that, you know, only one person in the whole company has read about, me. And during my presentation, I was just constantly interrupted by these two managers because they kept on wanting to add their own spin on things or their own thoughts or their own examples and they kept on hogging the conversation and trying to promote themselves as the expert on the situation. So when I read about this book talking about how men often have long stretches of talking or monologues to establish hierarchical structure, it doesn't surprise me. It just reminds me of the many times where the men at the previous job I worked at were so desperate to maintain hierarchy just to impress their boss. There's another excerpt I highlighted that says, some compelling proof that women are indeed not born any more capable of empathy or connection than men comes from psychologist Neil Bue. In 2013, Wei published a book called Deep Secrets, Boys' Friendships and the Crisis of Connection, which explores the friendships of young straight men. Wei followed a group of boys from childhood through adolescence and found that when they were little, boys' friendships with other boys were just as intimate and emotional as friendships between girls. It wasn't until the norms of masculinity sank in that the boys ceased to confide in or express vulnerable feelings for one another. By the age of 18, society's no homo creed had become so entrenched that they felt like the only people they could look to for emotional support were women, further perpetuating the notion that women are obligated by design to carry humanity's emotional cargo. Again, not really a surprise, but just something sad to think about how men are more than capable of emotional intelligence, but the way that we've been socialized changes so much of it that as we grow older, men aren't able to harness those tools or practice those things and instead that burden 
falls upon women. Something that I did not know about was where vocal fry had existed from. In many languages around the world, vocal fry is not some random quirk. It is built into their very phonology. There is an example at the author sites where a specific word in a Native American language requires you to use vocal fry in order to pronounce it correctly. They also say what's interesting about English speakers use of vocal fry is that early studies actually attributed the speech quality primarily to men. One of the first official observations of vocal fry in English was made by a UK linguist in the 1960s who determined that it was British dudes who employed vocal fry as a way of communicating a higher social standing. There was also an American study of creaky voice in the 1980s that called the phenomenon hypermasculine and a robust marker of male speech. I think it's interesting to reference British men as one of the early examples of vocal fry and I think that's just because vocal fry has been so feminized. Obviously when this was more prevalent among men historically this was seen as a sign of hyper masculinity. So the book was definitely an interesting read. I would rate it four stars along with a lot of the books I've read this month. The only reason why I wouldn't rate it five is because I do feel like it kind of leans into white feminism and I would have liked to see more chapters dedicated to different cultures rather than kind of applying like this lens of white Americans and saying it on behalf of like all women. But again, I still think that this is like a good introduction to this kind of topic. And in my next wrap up, you will see that I moved on to reading the author's other book called Cultish, which is about languages used in cults. And I found that to be way more interesting because that was a topic that I didn't know anything about. And from now on, instead of doing reading vlogs, I'm going to do more cook and book videos because I haven't done that in a hot minute. And some people were asking me to do more of that again. Otherwise, I'm going to end this video here. Go ahead and unsubscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.